ways that are happening um, and, and the injustices that are befalling our communities. How can we get our lawmakers to respond to us? So an organization that's doing very similar work, but on different types of cases, not you know terrorism, national security cases, a model that we've always aspired to is fam Families Against Mandatory Minimums. And that was started by impacted family members of prisoners who received draconian sentences for you know low-level drug offenses or um, really suffering from the sentencing guidelines in this country which are extremely harsh you know harsher than most countries around the world um, and so Anne is the director of uh, family outreach and storytelling she's done this type of work for more than 25 years and what FAM does so well is they're able to really um, you know harness family members' um, stories, their experiences, into action, into policy work, into legislative advocacy. Um, so how do we get our stories into you know, the hearts and minds of our lawmakers and actually impact policy in this country? So she's going to lead some exercises. I'm going to read her bio very quickly, and then I'll turn it over to her. I'm mostly here to keep time and help moderate. Um, Anne brings more than 25 years of communications experience to her work at FAM. She focuses on how to best tell the stories of prisoners and their families impacted by harsh sentencing laws. Before she came to FAM, Anne worked with other nonprofits to reach beyond the choir, to engage with out-of-the-box messaging that conveys the heart of the matter and motivates people to take action. Anne has four published books to her credit and has worked for numerous magazines, websites, and publishers. Please help me welcome Anne. Thank you so much, Lena. Um, I don't know if I should stand or sit, but I'll start standing, and then when I get really tired, I'll just sit down, <laughs> if that's okay with you. I also wanted to apologize. I'm coming off a two-week bout of laryngitis, so my voice is not so great. So if it starts to fade, I'll use sign language or something. Um, but um, thank you so much, Lena, for that introduction and to all of you for having me here today. I just feel, I feel actually extremely grateful, speaking for FAM, to meet you because we need you. Um, I, don't, I think this day is less about what you can bring FAM and what we can all do together than what I can bring you, to tell you the truth. Um, I'm also struck by something in my bio that I think I need to go back and fix. It says, uh, I work with getting the message beyond the choir. So I think that's true, but over the years that I've been at FAM, we've sort of changed our, the way we work, and we've all of a sudden realized, hey, that's a pretty big choir. <laughs> that choir is bigger than we thought it was. So let's, let's make sure the choir is all on board, meaning you guys, you know? Let's make sure we've talked to everybody, these disparate groups all over the country who have incarcerated loved ones, you know, all these family members. Why aren't we working more together? So it's less about convincing Senator XYZ or Congressman ABC that they should pass that bill. Of course, that's a huge part of what we do. But really, our storytelling, at least for now, and a lot of our work is in organizing you guys. So expanding the choir. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that today, and I'm also going to talk about, of course, storytelling. Um, I wanted to start with this, this video. It's, we make Part of our storytelling is um, we have a lot of stories on our website. Um, the, I don't know if you've looked at FAM's website, but we have them there, and I've printed out some of, some of them here. And we, once we work on a story, all of our staff members and lobbyists really live, eat, breathe, sleep the story, and we just tell that story over and over and over again, and I'll talk more about that. But another thing we do that works very well is we make videos. We have a whole video department. And so this video that I'd like to show you is one of our most recent, and it sometimes our videos focus on a particular story, focus on a particular legislative effort, focus on education, and sometimes our videos focus on how to advocate, and that's what this one is really about. So is it ready to go? Or not quite. Not quite ready, ready. okay. okay. So we'll come back to that. Um, but I, I wanted to talk a, a little bit about myself, and I know we're a little pressed for time, so I'll just, I'm gonna move a little more quickly through this than, 
than I had planned. But um, as Lena was saying, I've worked um, my whole professional career, and actually since I was a little girl, in telling stories. That's always what I wanted to do. Um, I am one of those people who actually doesn't really like to tell my own story. I really like telling other people's story. Um, I've done a lot of ghost writing in my life, and that is, for a long time, that was where my sweet spot is. I just really like inhabiting another person's story. So if you need somebody to tell your story, talk to me, because that's really what I like doing. Um, but I also like thinking about, I'm a real storytelling geek, I like thinking about how stories work and what pushes the right buttons and what pushes the wrong buttons. Language really sings to me. I just, I am a big story and language geek. Um, so that leads me to what storytelling means. I just went to a storytelling conference in Nashville, Tennessee that was beautiful and fantastic and highly produced and there were these fantastic special effects and the theme of the storytelling conference was wonder. And it was all about awakening wonder and, and that's really great. We all should awaken wonder. But I came away from the conference thinking like, what are the, where's the, what stories are they telling? It was confusing to me. They didn't really define what storytelling meant to them. They just talked about awakening wonder, which is great. <laughs> But so I want to talk to you for a moment about what storytelling is, because lots of people I think might be embarrassed to ask that question. Storytelling is a lot of different things. Storytelling can be this. It can be a written story. It can be a book. You read stories when you were kids. Those are stories. But storytelling can also be this. It can also be us talking to each other. It can also be a letter to the editor. It can also be an op-ed. It can also be a letter to your representative. It can also be a cup of coffee with your neighbor. It can be lots of different things. So today we're going to talk about storytelling in general. And so when I say your story, here's what you can do to make your story more effective, I'm not just talking about this. I'm talking about everything I just said. When you're talking to your neighbor next door, you know, when you finally tell your loved one's story to somebody who might be surprised by it, when you decide, hey, I want to I write a letter to my local newspaper, this isn't right, all those are the stories I'm talking about, okay? So just so we're all on the same page about what that word means. Story is much more than just writing. And also, this is important, if you don't think you're a writer, if you hate writing, that's okay, you can still be a storyteller. And if you hate speaking, you can still be a storyteller. There are many ways to tell stories. So m my goal is to get at all the ways, not just one over the other. Um, now I think I want to go a little bit um, over the way today will work. I want to keep things really simple. Um, there are so many threads to issue of criminal justice reform. It can be so big. There are so many ways we can go. We can talk about that we can talk about the First Step Act, which is this bill. I don't know if you guys have heard of it, but we talk a lot about it at FAM. It has it could really influence our loved ones. We could talk about the First Step Act for weeks. But we're going to talk today, we're going to keep it really simple. We're going to talk about what your stories are and how to tell them most effectively, whether you're writing them, whether you're telling them, whether you're talking to a neighbor over a cup of tea. So we're going to keep it really simple. What are your stories? What are the challenges in telling them because of who your listeners are and how to tell the stories most effectively? So we're going to stick to that as best we can. Um, the other thing is, um, <clears throat> one of the things I value most about storytelling is that it allows me to be really vulnerable. So when you tell stories most effectively is when you get to a real vulnerable, sometimes kind of scary, place. And I want to tell you that this room today, as you all tell your stories and work on our storytelling exercise, is a really safe place. We've heard that, you know, that's almost become a buzzword, a safe space. It is a safe space in this room. But I want it also to be a brave space, okay? I want you to maybe talk about things today that you haven't told anybody before, about your situation, about your loved one's situation. It's a brave space, okay? Because only by being brave and vulnerable, are you going to be able to tell the stories that will really push the needle on change, okay? Um, so I want to start with that. 
Um, that's a little bit how, how we're going to operate today. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about FAM. Um, we got started, um, first of all, we just changed our name. We were, for many years, we were called Families Against Mandatory Minimums. But lately, we've realized, hey, we do a lot more than just work on mandatory minimums. Um, I'll start by asking, or I'll just say, there might be some people who don't know what mandatory minimum sentencing is. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sentence that has to be imposed because the prosecutor calls for it. And it's, it's generally a very long sentence, and it's mandatory. It's, it's, a, it's, the, it's the lowest the judge is allowed to sentence. And I'm going to confess something to you. Before I took this job at FAM, my, my job right before this was working for an environmental nonprofit, which was very interesting. But then I came to FAM, and I am not a lawyer. And they hired me because they wanted a storyteller. They wanted a writer. They wanted somebody almost from the outside, because sometimes it's much easier to see the story from the outside than in, at least in the beginning. So I came to this, and I thought, when you did something wrong, and you were arrested, and you went on trial, and the judge stood up there and gave you the sentence, I thought the judge decided the sentence. But in so many cases, the judge does not decide the sentence. It's the prosecutor who decides the sentence. Please stop me if everybody knows this, and this is too basic for you. But anyhow, that, I, that was sort of news to me, and I thought, wait a minute. I don't think I'm alone in this. Wait a minute. You mean the judge, the judge who knows this case really well, the judge who, who has met the defendant, who has read his pre-sentence report investigation, the judge who's, who's heard from the family members, the judge who spent a lot of time hearing about this case, he doesn't decide, he or she doesn't decide? No, it was the prosecutor calling for the sentence. So that was news to me. But anyhow, we worked for many years on just getting rid of mandatory minimum sentences. And then lately, we've changed our work. We've expanded. We do a lot more than just work on bad sentencing laws. So we decided to call ourselves just FAM because mandatory minimums doesn't quite cover it. Um, anyhow, we were started um, in 1991 by a woman named Julie Stewart. And she, Julie worked um, at a think tank in Washington called the Cato Institute. And um, one day, she was at her desk doing her work. It was the middle of the day, and she got a phone call from her mother. And her mother said, you're not going to believe this. Jeff has been arrested. Jeff is, was, is Julie's brother. And Julie said, oh, no, what did he do this time? And he lived in Washington State, and he was growing some marijuana in his garage. And, um, and Julie thought, oh, you know, what a jerk. He messed up again. And she thought he'd get a slap on the wrist or maybe probation because it was pot in his garage. Uh, so Jeff went to trial, and they called for the mandatory minimum, and he got five, a five-year sentence. So he was sentenced and did five years in prison for growing marijuana in his garage. And Julie just was appalled. She thought, this is crazy. This is way too much time. I can't, this, this can't be happening in our country. So she decided, she still had her job at the Cato Institute, and she decided to put out some feelers and find out if anybody else had been going through if their loved ones were also facing mandatory minimums. And this was in 1991, so she couldn't go on Facebook, she couldn't, you know, message her friends about it, but she started sending out letters to prisons, and she started contacting some judges she knew. And she started gathering family members, and she started holding meetings, and they looked exactly like this meeting, maybe not as many people. But it would be card tables and cha plastic chairs, and it would be family members who were devastated. And she found out that the five years that Jeff, her brother, got was actually easy. He got, he got off easy because the stories she started hearing were appalling. She heard about a woman named Stephanie Nod who was caught up in her boyfriend's drug conspiracy, and she was serving life. Life. Stephanie Nod was serving life. Stephanie Nod later got commuted, her, her sentence got commuted by Bill Clinton. But she was a girl, we call them girlfriend situations, and there's plenty of them, where um, women will, you know, be on the outer edge of a drug conspiracy and be responsible for the whole, the whole thing and end up doing these crazy, ridiculous times. So that's what happened to Stephanie. And so Julie started hearing more and more of these stories, and she said, this is ridiculous. i got to do something about it. So she just happened to be one of those kind of people. She just, she wouldn't stop. She wouldn't stop. And somehow, from the very start, she knew that the best tool she had 
were not lawyers, apologies to any lawyers in the room, the lawyers were certainly helpful and she needed them, <laughs> but she knew that the best tool she had were those stories, the stories of Stephanie Nod, the stories of her own brother, the stories of all these, and so she started asking for stories, and she started with one card table and a big shoebox full of letters from prisoners, saying, call my mom, call my mom, you know, call my mom, call my sister, call my husband, he can tell you my story. All these letters, and the stories kept pouring in, kept pouring in. And so she took these stories, and she went to the hill, and she said, can you believe this is happening? What, what, what? And they started listening, they started listening. And gradually, FAM grew and got bigger and bigger and started making changes. We really did, we've got some, we work at the federal level, so we've, we've made some, you know, it's interesting because uh, it seems overwhelming and it seems very sad, this issue that we all work on, criminal justice reform, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. And FAM has, has done some great stuff over the years. And so we work at the federal level and we also work at the state level. Um, is it working? Um, where's where's the credit for having somebody? Uh, to, do you know how to use this thing? If it's working, we can start watching the movie, but... Um, <coughs> Keep going, okay. All right, we'll come back to the movie. I'll introduce you to Nita in a second. But um, anyhow, so it's always been, uh, from, the, from the beginning, the motto of FAM has been that the punishment should fit the crime. So when you go with that kind of a motto, the punishment should fit the crime, that is saying there should be punishment. So what I'm getting at here is that FAM doesn't work on innocence cases. We're not the Innocence Project. I think the Innocence Project is amazing. I think exoneration cases are, are really interesting to work on. But in terms of what we're working on, FAM at least, it's that punishment should fit the crime. So in fact, the storytelling we do, we look for those hard cases where somebody actually does deserve punishment, but they don't deserve, you know, Julie's brother, uh, let, uh, let me just put it out to you. Growing some marijuana in your garage, what do you think would be a fair punishment? No no prior history, no prior crime. What do you think the punishment should be? No punishment, no punishment. Yeah, so a lot of people would say that. Or they would say 18 months, something like that, but five years, five years in federal prison. So, so anyhow, that's why the cases we tell, there, there is some punishment involved. In fact, we get a lot of mail from prisoners saying, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, please tell my story. And I have to say to them, fam is not the right place. You know, yes, your story should be told, but we're, not, we're about sentence length. We're about, you know, the punishment should fit the crime. So, so what I'm getting at is, this, and this is where it's related to you guys, so the stories we tell, these are hard stories. These are stories that, I mean, for, for someone like me who likes a writing challenge, a storytelling challenge, this is it. Because we have to take these people who actually have done crimes, you know? They're, they're, they're difficult stories. They're hard to make sympathetic. And we have to make them sympathetic because they are sympathetic. Even, even you know, the most hard-bitten stories that we get, not maybe not the most, but... There, there are always reasons, there are, there's always reasons why they should get, it. everybody deserves individualized justice, everybody, even, even really tough cases. But, so I'm telling you, we face the same kind of storytelling challenges that you guys do. How do you make these stories sympathetic? And also in the face of, so, so, so let's talk for a second about who your listener is. Your listener might be somebody who's really afraid of your loved one. You know, who's afraid of, of what they might do, what they were accused of doing, all these things. Those, that, that's, a, that's a hard challenge. How do you tell a story? How do you tell a persuasive story to somebody who's afraid of you, who, who thinks you, you don't matter, who really doesn't care? I'm sorry, I got bigger fish to fry. You know, how do you tell that story? Um, so there's a lot of fear involved, and, and we're, we're very familiar with that. Um, so, so I think in terms of, of storytelling, what, I mean, I need to hear more from you. I'm not entirely sure where you all stand on telling your own stories, but, but in terms of the kind of stories you tell and the people you're telling them to, I think we have a lot in common. Um,
<laughs> that happens to me all the time. So, you know, I think I've probably talked enough about FAM for now. What I'd like to do is, so we're going to watch this video. I'm going to talk a little bit more about storytelling mechanics. I thought we'd do a group storytelling exercise, and then you guys, I want to hear all of your stories. But before that, I, I think it would be a good idea to just hear at least who you are, if you want to tell me your names and your loved one's name and maybe where you've come from today. I think that would be nice. We can all just introduce each other and, and save the longer story for, for later in the day. But if, if you want to just do a short introductions now, I, I think that would be great. Does that sound good? Okay. So um, let's see. We already, we already met Kathy, and we already met Lynn. Does the gentleman to the left of Lynn, do you want to say your name and a little bit about why you're here? Yeah. Uh, wonderful. Uh, in, in or out? Um, uh, yeah, I'll pass, pass the mic around yeah. so we can. I would, I would, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's just see what we can do once we have some minutes. Sorry about that. Thanks for helping. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Sabri Ben Kahla, Ben Kahla in Arabic. I was uh, actually imprisoned, um, I would say, unjustly. Um, originally, I was. I was studying overseas in Saudi Arabia and kept I mean, arrested over there, kept in a secret prison by the order of the United States government. And then they brought me back in uh, 2003. And I went to trial in 2004 and I was acquitted. And uh, about less than a year later, they subpoenaed me to a grand jury and asked me the same stuff from the trial I was acquitted of. Did I do such and such? And I said no. So they said I was lying. And they gave me immunity, full immunity, so I could be convicted. I could not be convicted of anything except perjury or obstruction of justice, and that's what they convicted me of. And instead of the normal one to two year sentence, I got 10 years because of the enhancement. And um, I've never had a crime before in my life. I studied George Mason, uh, graduate studies at Johns Hopkins. Um, I have an Islamic law degree from Saudi Arabia. and. So it's a brief background, so you said not to tell the longer story later. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. You want to pass the mic up? Dad, he's here because of me. Oh. <laughs> I can talk about that. <laughs> okay. Good. What, what's your name? Ahmed bin Kahla. Thank you for coming. And what do you know? What do you want to know about me? <laughs> well, I, I, you, I know you're his dad. That's great. That's great. And uh, pass it. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Gassan Balut. I'm a, a co-defendant with the Alarian case, and I was acquitted. I'm here also support for the families and also a board member of the NCBCF. My name is Sayan Abdurrahman. I come from Minneapolis. My son is a career. He got 10 years for prison. My name is Ayan Farah, I'm family Farah, and uh, my two sons is uh, Adnan Farah and uh, Mohamed Farah. He's a Mohamed Farah, he's a 24, he's a seven, he's a 30 years. I come from Minneapolis, he's a Adnan, he's a 10 years. My name is Nida Abu Bakr, um, the daughter of Shukri Abu Bakr, who was um, one of the founders of the Holy Land Foundation, and he's serving a 65 year sentence in a maximum security federal prison and next month, Thanksgiving weekend, ironically, will um, mark the 10th year of the HLF-5 being in prison. So. Good morning everyone, my name is Nadia Abusod, my son Mohammed Alisa and also his friend Carlos Almonte, they both sentenced in the same day. Boston Bam Mohammed get uh, 22 years and Carlos get 20 years. I'm from in New Jersey. Thank you. My name is Umayma Jaffrey. Uh, I'm from Toledo, Ohio, and my husband is Ibrahim Mohammed. Um, you might know him from the Free Ibrahim Now movement from last year. Um, he is being held at a federal prison in Milan, Michigan, and he just took a plea deal last April. So he has 
we're blessed. We, he only has a year and a half to go before he's deported. Um, and so we're just waiting for that day. Hi, my name is Ashley Young. I am here um, uh, on behalf of my brother, Nicholas Young, um, who is currently in prison. And I live right here in DC. My name is Khan um, Abdurrahman. I'm the sister of Zikri Abdurrahman from Minnesota. Um, a group of, uh, it, was, it was a case of seven young men who were all friends and um, amongst um, my auntie and Farah's sons and uh, four other boys um, were incarcerated from, uh, I suppose, years ranging from 10 to 35. Assalamualaikum. My name is Sonali Sadiqi. I am the sister of Rashida Sadiqi, uh, who is now in Mississippi. Uh, we are going on our 11th year, and we have six more years to go. It's a 17 year sentence. It was, and my brother was actually kidnapped from Bangladesh by the, uh, on behalf of CIA and brought to the U.S. For four days, we didn't know where he was. He basically disappeared, and then CNN broke the news. Um, so, close it there for now. Assalamu alaikum, I'm from Bangladesh. My son was prison. Um, this is the Das. Um, um, they, don't, um, they don't decide he has maybe 20 years. He's 24 years old. He's pretty true. Is affected of the FBI yeah. in from My name is Beverly Henry. Um, on behalf of on behalf of my grandson, Emmanuel Lutchman. He served in twenty years um, in prison. Um, so I'm from South Florida. Hello, my name is Omar Lutchman, and I'm here on behalf of my son, Emmanuel Lutchman. Um, he's doing 20 years, so. Hello, my name is Linda Woods. I'm the mother of Eric Jamel Hendricks. He is now in uh, Ohio at the Youngstown um, uh, Northeast Correctional Center. Uh, he's been there since I was 16. He had a trial in March, and they convicted him. He was supposed to be sentenced on, in August, but he has not been sentenced yet. Uh, they're waiting on some kind of motion from the judge, John Adams, and I'm just hoping for a miracle. Yes, I'm Angela Carlin. I'm not here on behalf of Mr. Lutchman. Uh, I Cornell. They gave him for a year. I'm John Cornell, and I'm here on behalf of my son, Rahil Marusu Beta, Christopher Cornell, and uh, he was given a 30-year sentence, and uh, we're just getting started, you know, so it's painful and it's hard. Hello, Asalaamu Alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Sania Siraj. My brother name is Shawar Mateen Siraj, and he's serving 30 years um, in prison, he completed his 14 years already. Assalamu My name is Raja Khan. I'm from the United States. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Shahina Siraj. I'm Shahwar Mateen Siraj. My mother is the NYPD, the paid agent or undercover, and the CIA is the मेरे बेटे को देशक गर्दी के केस में फंसाया और उसको तीस साल की सजा दी है और अब मेरे बेटे को चौदह साल हो गए हैं मैं इंतजार कर रही हूँ बहुत दुआएं भी मांग रही हूँ और उसके साथ साथ बहुत काम भी करती हूँ ताकि कहीं न कहीं से कुछ अच्छा हो जाए मेरे बेटे के लिए और सब के लिए शुक्रिया उन्हें न्य� she said that uh, my name is Shahina Parveen Siraj, I'm mother of Shawar Mateen Siraj. Uh, he was uh, entrapped by um, NYPD paid informant and one of the undercover uh, officer in terrorism case. 
in 2004 and um, he got 30 years in prison and he's serving for, he's already served 14 years and he's still, she's still working hard for you know my brother and for other brothers to come out as much as she can Uh, my name is Inas Schnur. I'm here on behalf of my brother, Mohamed Schnur. Uh, he's currently incarcerated in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, he's serving a life sentence. He's been there for about 10, 12 years now, almost. Um, yeah. My name is Subhi Badra. I mean, we have my nephew, Nidal Ayed. Uh, just a brief story. Nidal Ayed came to this country, a young teenager, who was very excellent in school. He graduated from high school, he, he plus, and he joined the college. He graduated from the college, and after that, he got his job, and he got his family, for his family. After that, he was charged with conspiracy, something like that, uh, which is he never be involved in any politics or any religious things or something like that. But after that, he was sentenced for 117 years, which is, I do not believe he will live that uh, much years. Uh, and now he spent over 26 years. He lost his family, his child, born after he was in jail. And up to now, his mother is suffering and his brother is suffering from all this time. I, I think it's enough 26 years. That's too much. Thank you. Assalamu My name is Leila Yagi. I'm the mother of Ziyad Yagi. Um, my son got 31.5 years. Uh, that one day he's for conspiring, that one day he's going to do a um, uh, violent act in the future. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Maryam Abu Ali, and I am the sister of Ahmed Abu Ali. Um, my brother was detained uh, illegally in Saudi Arabia, where he was a student for two years without charges. Um, he was um, coerced. He was tortured and coerced to read a written confession. And uh, when the U.S. government brought him back, um, they charged him with conspiracy and material support to terrorism, and he was um, convicted, and the only evidence that was used was the confession tape. Uh, he was initially sentenced to 30 years, and then um, his sentence was increased to life, and he has been in solitary confinement um, ever since, and so it's been since 2003. He's at the ADX in Florence, Colorado. Yesterday, if you were here, but I'm 
I'm always grateful to come back because this really does mean a lot. Um, I remember talking to Steve like years, years ago about just needing something like this and then suddenly it happens. So thank you for coming and keeping it together. Wow, thank you so much. Um, even just, even just that, uh, it's okay. Just what I heard was really um, emotional and I really appreciate you sharing all that. And I also see and hear so many strong advocates. Um, so the, the video that I want you to watch now, um, it's about a woman named Vida Ajamu. And her, um, she's been advocating for her brother Robert Ship for a long, long, long time. And Robert's story is actually in the folder I gave you. It's posted on our website. And much of his story is actually in his own words. Um, it has a little introduction, but a lot of it's in his own words. He's been in prison now over 25 years. And he's actually going to be out pretty soon in 2019. Um, but Robert is a uh, is an incredible example of success on the inside. These are stories we tell, too, a lot um, about people who make the most of a terrible situation. Anyhow, so that's what his story in the folder is about. But this video is about Vita's story. And Vita is you. Vita is a sister who, from day one, has just been sad and frustrated and driven. And she wasn't driven right away. She was really frustrated and felt like giving up early on. She just felt like, this is ridiculous, I can't fight this system, I'm so sad, why even try? And then, and then she sort of got this fire lit in her, and since then, she's been really vocal and powerful. And she came, FAMP did a, um, something similar to what you guys are doing this weekend and Monday. We did a rally at the Capitol in June, and we did a lobby day the next day where we went to the Capitol and had group, small groups meet with their representatives. And Vita was just a ball of fire. She was really, um, she knows how to do this and she won't stop. More than, I mean, it's, you can figure out how to do this. We can, we can give you the tools to do this. But what we can't give you that you have to find yourself is determination and will and passion because it can be so sad. <laughs> And she knows that. Um, and somehow she's, she's kept that drive this whole time. And even when Robert gets out, he should be out next year. Um, I was really moved by your story, too, because even when Robert gets out, they both have big plans to stay involved and be advocates for reform in, in this broken system. So anyway, I'll show you her story. Um, and I would, I would just charge you, the point of this video is to be like Vita. Be her. That's, that's, what, that's what we're asking you. Um, so I can't dim the lights, but I'll turn them off. Just perfect. I think that would be the best. Yeah. about my brother, but I got to a point that I said, 
he needs you. I said, uh, do you know how it feels to be held captive? When you know you have so much to offer? By that time, I was just fired up, and I was, to be quite honest, I was pissed off. And I said, no, no longer. All right, y'all, get ready to go. Right. I'm going to D.C. for a fam's rally. I'm going to meet with lawmakers. I'm going to talk to family members. I'm going to talk to advocates. I'm not nervous. I cannot wait. We're so thankful that you guys came. This event is about family. We need reform now. We're not waiting any longer. We're going to be out here today. Tomorrow we're going to swarm the Senate, and we're going to tell these folks we need justice reform now. Our goals today are very, very simple, and they're very clear. We're going to explain to members of Congress why the First Step Act helps families of prisoners. I'm not a big talker. So, advocating was a bit difficult for me in the beginning. Sometimes I have to speak up and speak out. What I want people to understand about the First Step Act, every day counts for people like me, for my brother, people that's in prison. People should contact the legislators, the Congress people, the senators, and find out where they are on the issues, and also advocate for loved ones who've been incarcerated. she did, did and also her brother benefited from he had life he was given life in prison for drug conspiracy but he he got his sentence knocked down to 30 years because of an amendment called drugs minus two which changed the criminal history category he was sentenced under that Pam worked for actually um, so he was resentenced 30 years though <laughs> that's a lifetime um, but but he will be out so there's there is hope in his story um, but we're, we're not really focusing on that kind of hope today. We're going to focus on her hope because that's what that's what you guys need to do. I mean, otherwise you're just going to sit in a closet all day and cry. And who needs that? <laughs> I mean, you can do that if you want, but um, I don't know. I, I think you got to tell your stories. So, and I think you got to try to be like Vita. So, um, so I want to back up a little bit to what Fam does. We do advocacy work and legislative lobbying. So we have a staff of people who go to the Hill, and this is their job. This is their job to be lobbyists, and they know who to talk to, and they have that Rolodex of the phone numbers, and they know the lingo and all that. Um, and they do that here in Washington, D.C., and they also do that in this, on the state level, in the states that we work in. Um, we also do education, 
and we try to change hearts and minds. And so that's what I was talking about earlier, speaking beyond the choir. So we do try to inform people about things they didn't even, what is a mandatory minimum, you know, things that they didn't even know about. And I'm sure you guys have a lot in your stories that most of the people in this country are just completely ignorant of. So there's that too. Um, and then the other thing we do is tell our stories. And the storytelling serves a bunch of different purposes. But in terms of what I just talked about, changing hearts and minds, education, and lobbying, the storytelling is the best tool we have. It's the sharpest tool in our toolbox. I guarantee it. Julie Stewart knew that 27 years ago, and we know it today. I'll just tell you one example. So there was a lawmaker who was dead set for mandatory minimums. And at some point, about 15 years ago, a lobbyist, it wasn't, um, it wasn't, a family member, it was a lobbyist, visited with him and told him the story about a woman who was incarcerated and she left three kids behind and her husband was really sick and it was a very, very sad story. And by the end of that meeting, he had changed, done a complete 180. So, so these stories act really can work to sway lawmakers. They really, really can. They're, they're the sharpest tool we have. Um, so, also, I was just thinking of this on the way up here. I don't know if you guys followed the Brett Kavanaugh com confirmation hearing, but I was thinking about those women who were yelling at Jeff Flake in the elevator. You know, I don't know what, what made him do what he did and, and ask for um, a delay, but it's kind of interesting that it was them yelling their story. And so I was talking about the different ways you can tell your story, and I forgot to put yelling at a lawmaker in an <laughs> elevator or in a restaurant on the list, but that is a way to tell a story. <laughs> so, uh, and who knows if that was what changed his mind or not, but um, I wanted to tell you, just so you can feel like um, you can hear a, a few of our stories that we work on, and then we're going to move more into yours, um, some of the stories in the folder I gave you. Um, we also, we pick stories, this is going to sound uh, sort of bad, but sometimes we pick stories for their sensational value because they make they make an impact. They really make an impact. They're stories that have um, uh, click worthy click worthy names, and one of them is the story of Cynthia Powell. Um, there's nothing there's nothing flip or silly though, or at all sort of charming about her story. But her her the title of the story that we gave is um, 25 Years for 35 Pills. And Cynthia's story is, is really tragic. She um, is a grandmother. She lived in Florida. She struggled. She lived in poverty. Um, but she always was a great mother, still is a great mother. Um, her daughter is actually now her advocate. Her daughter is doing a ton of work for us. She's, she would sit in these chairs, too, if she could come to D.C. Um, her daughter's name is Jackie. But anyhow, Cynthia was a great mom, and she had um, she was not a drug addict. She didn't sell drugs. She didn't. She had no crime. She had no priors at all. Um, and she uh, had very bad diabetes. And she took a medication for her nerve pain from the diabetes. And somebody in the neighborhood knew she took this medication. And somebody in the neighborhood got in some trouble themselves. And the prosecutor said, okay, somebody, um, could you help us out? Could you, could you, uh, we want you to give us some information. And so they set this person up to call Cynthia several times and say, I know you have that medication. Can I just buy a few pills from you? And Cynthia said, I don't sell my pills. No way. The person called again and again and again. Finally, one month, Cynthia's having a really hard time making ends meet. She just can't pay the bills. It's nothing new, but it just seems to be particularly bad that month. And the phone call comes right at the right time. And the person said, come on, come on, just 35 pills. It'll just take a sec. Just meet me behind the, the, um, just meet me behind the McDonald's in the parking lot. So Cynthia says, okay. So she gets in this battered old green car she has, and she goes behind the McDonald's, and it's dark, and this person comes up to the car, and Cynthia, Cynthia rolls down the window, and she sells them 35 pills. She gets $300, $300 in her hands, 35 pills passes. The person's a confidential informant. It's been set up this whole time. So the police come in. They arrest Cynthia. 
And because of the weight of those 35 pills, this is a state case, this is not a federal, this is in Florida. Because of a Florida law that says the weight of those pills will trigger a mandatory minimum, the prosecutor calls for the mandatory minimum, and Cynthia gets 25 years in prison. 25 years in prison. She was not an addict, she was not a drug dealer, she was, she was about as low on the totem pole as you can get. She was somebody really struggling to get by who didn't see a lot of options in her life, who was really pressured. Cynthia was even, she was kind of a naive person. She was, she was I don't want to use the word innocent because I told you we don't do innocent cases, but she was innocent in a way, so much so that during the trial she just didn't, she didn't seem to comprehend what was going on and she asked the judge, she said, please, please, can I just do the time at home? You know, can I just, can I, can I, can I do some kind of restitution? And that's about as far from 25 years as you can imagine. And the judge said, as many judges do, I am so sorry, Miss Powell, my hands are tied. I have no choice. I have no choice. So he had to give her 25 years. So she's in, I think she's in her 15th year now, and they call her mama. They call her mama at the prison because she can't stop doing what she does best. She helps everybody. She's a mom to everybody. So she's making the most of her time, I guess, but that's a very sad story. And she left Jackie at home. She left, I mean, it's a, it's a really sad story. So that's one of the stories. You can read it and you can see what Cindy, Cynthia looks like. Um, the next story is Michael Giles. Um, Michael Giles is also a Florida case, and interestingly enough, and sort of mysteriously enough, his story on our website is the most visited page on our website, and we're not entirely sure why. He's quite a handsome man. That might have something to do with it, but I, I don't know. Anyhow, uh, actually, I don't think I gave you Michael's. I'm sorry. He's not in there. You're going to have to go to our website. Now I've tempted you. Um, anyhow, maybe that's why. So, so Michael, um, he was... Um, in the Air Force, I'm sorry, not the Air Force. He was in the Army, and he was um, he what's it called? Oh, he was on leave. He was on leave, and he was in uh, Tampa, Florida, and he was out with some friends, and he had a license to carry a gun, and he had the gun in his glove, the glove compartment of his car, and they went to a club, and they parked in the parking lot of the club. And um, they went in the club, and then a fight broke out in the club. And it's so much so, a whole bunch of people were involved, it spilled out into the parking lot. And um, Michael got really nervous, and he made a bad decision in that moment. Again, not innocent. He made a de bad decision. He decided, I'm so nervous here, I'm going to go get that gun. So he went to his car, and he got the gun out of his glove compartment. He went back to try to get his friends and say, let's get the heck out of here. And at that moment, somebody who was in the middle of the fight sort of jumped on Michael from behind and sort of knocked him down. So Michael whirled around and, and his gun went, he shot his gun. He wasn't aiming at anybody, but he hit somebody in the knee. This person he hit in the knee later said, I was fine, I was in the hospital for a day, it didn't really hurt me. But anyhow, this is somebody who did, you know, fire a gun in the middle of a crowd. He had a gun that he was licensed to carry. Anyhow, he already had a Purple Heart. He, he's, he's, a, he's a vet, you know, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, but he did do this thing in the parking lot. So anyhow, Michael also got 25 years because of laws in Florida. So he's in prison now for 25 years. And his mother, Phyllis Giles, she's a friend of mine, and she's a very strong advocate. She's been on TV, she's written op-eds, she's, she's really figured out how to tell their story so it makes a difference. And that actually might be why his his profile is visited so often because she tells a really strong story. Um, that's Michael's story. The other one in here is um, a woman named Dee Dee Cup. Another issue that FAM works on is called compassionate release. And I don't know if any of your loved ones are eligible for compassionate release or know about compassionate release. Does anybody in here know what compassionate release is? Yes. Okay. A few people. So compassionate release is something, um, this is going to make you really angry, <laughs> but here we go. Part of this, part of this project is, is feeling something. Um, so compassionate release is something that Congress put into law in the 1980s, and they said that if a prisoner has been in federal prison for a certain amount of time of their sentence, 75% of their sentence, and they're really, really sick, and, and the medical department at the prison says you have met these certain criteria 
or they're over 65 years old. They've served 75% of their sentence and they're over 65 years old. Or they have an extraordinary circumstance back home. For example, they have little kids and this, the parent who's still at home died and there's nobody to take care of the kids, something like that. Congress said, these are loopholes. These are things we're going to put into law that say you need to let that person out. That's just how it works. But then they made a mistake. They said, here's the process. You apply for compassionate release. The prisoner applies for compassionate release because they think they meet a certain criteria. They apply to compassionate release to the warden of the prison. Then the warden of the prison has to approve or deny, and they send that approval or denial to the original sentencing judge, and the sentencing judge says, great, fine, I, I agree. So the problem is with this warden part of the scenario, because wardens are charged with keeping people locked up. Why would they want to let somebody out? Their whole they wake up in the morning and think, how can I keep these people locked up in the best possible way? Why would they at all want to take the time or the energy or the brain power to think about maybe this person should be out because, you know, they've got stage four cancer and they're 82 years old and it's costing us a lot of money to keep it. They don't think that. So they drag their feet. These applications, I mean, the stories we've heard from family members are so heartbreaking. Somebody gets denials that happen. Uh, approvals that happen but after the person has died they really drag their feet in the process the applications get lost I mean it's it's their tragic stories so Dee Dee Cup's story which is in there is about her husband Ron he was an addict and he he was arrested and and convicted of low-level drug stuff and he got um, cancer and they applied for compassionate release he was denied twice and, um, and then finally he died, but he was so sick that the communication, as I'm sure you know, is so bad between prison and loved one and family members and BOP that he died um, four months after he was diagnosed and um, she didn't get to see him the last two months of his life because he was so sick he couldn't make it to the visiting room. And he was also so sick he couldn't even make it to the phone. So she had no, and when he died, she only found out he died because a week after he died, the chaplain at the, at the prison called her. And then two weeks after that, the warden's office finally called and she said, yeah, I already know, I already got his ashes. So that's really sad. So anyhow, um, Dee Dee though, I'm not telling you his story just to tell you another sad story because I could do that for the next year. I'm telling you his story because of who Dee Dee has become. She lives in Virginia here. She came to our rally. She met Vita. They're close friends now. And um, Dee Dee decided that, well, Ron, one of the last times she ever saw him, he said, please promise me you'll try to change this. Please promise me you'll work on this. So she made a promise to him. She didn't know he was going to die so soon, but she made a promise anyway. And so after she sort of got out of the intense grief she was in after his death, she decided she needed to start telling his story. So she did. And in fact, the night before um, our lobby day, she stood up in front of uh, the fam community and told his story, and we were all crying. In fact, one of the waiters at the restaurant like put down the food and came and gave her a hug. And it was, it was quite um, it, it, quite impactful. So, so I asked Dee Dee to write up her story, why I tell my story, and I thought that would be good for you guys to read. You don't have to read it now, but um, that she's, if you're wondering why you should even tell anybody this, just talk to Dee Dee Cup because because she knows. Um, uh, a couple other stories in there. Paul Fields, he was you know arrested for growing marijuana. He got life. I mean, he didn't get life. He got 16 years. He was just his sentence was commuted by Obama. Um, so these are sad stories. Cindy Shank's story is not in there, but I want to give a shout out to you guys. If, if any of you have HBO or you have access to it, there's a new movie just premiered last Monday called The Sentence. Um, does anybody have HBO? Yes. Okay. If you don't have it, you can actually sign up for a free week trial, watch the movie, and then cancel the trial. <laughs> um, uh, anyhow, it's a it's a it's called the sentence, and the filmmaker is a man named Rudy Valdez. And um, I mentioned to you a little earlier about these girlfriend cases. His sister Cindy Shank, her boyfriend um, was selling drugs out of the house that they shared, 
Um, she, it was just, her house was on the, her name was on the lease. She had nothing to do, she didn't even count the money, she had nothing to do with the sales. But when he was arrested, she was deemed to be part of the conspiracy. So she got sentenced to 15 years in prison. Between the time she was arrested and when she went to prison, a lot of time passed. Two, actually, three years passed. Um, the, the, they decided not to prosecute, and then they changed their mind, and they came back. So in that time, Cindy really turned her life around. She was an addict before. She got sober. She met a new guy. She got married to him. They had two beautiful daughters. They were building their dream house, all these amazing things. Years pass, and then there's a knock on the door in the middle of the night. Why is it always the middle of the night? In the middle of the night. She's actually nursing her baby when the knock comes on the door. Knock comes on the door. They come in. It's law enforcement. They come in, and she ends up getting sentenced to 15 years. So devastating, devastating. So her brother, Rudy, he happens to be really interested in amateur video. So he start and, and Cindy's not going to see her kids for 15 years. At this point, she's got a newborn, a two-year-old, and a four-year-old, or a three-year-old and a five-year-old, I can't remember. But she's got three little girls, three little girls. She's not going to see them for 15 years. Phone calls whenever they can do it. So Rudy says, I'm going to start filming this family. And then when Cindy comes back, she can see everything she missed. She can see the dance recitals. She can see the speeches. She can see the birthday party. She can see all that. Plus, I don't know what else I can do. This is something that you guys might be feeling. Like, what can I do? How can I feel totally helpless. So he decided, OK, I'm going to hide behind this camera and just film. So he started filming. And actually, as the years passed, and the dance recitals happened, and the birthday parties happened, and the baseball games happened, he realized he had some pretty interesting stuff here. And he was pretty good at it. So he decided to put it together into a movie. He had hundreds, thousands of hours of footage at this point. And um, so he put it together into a movie. And he made it. And it's called The Sentence. And they showed it at Sundance. And it won an award. And then HBO picked it up. And it is just a beautiful movie about the impact of these kind of sentences and this kind of incarceration on a family because he just follows the girls so closely. So for messaging and for storytelling, this was a golden opportunity for us. Like you don't have, it would be as if we came into your houses right now and just started filming all the time. Um, so I highly recommend watching that film if you can. Um, which brings me to my next point. So you guys just went around and you told about your loved ones and you told about their sentence. And that was enough to make me teary. And those are very, very difficult, sad stories. And I appreciate you telling them so much. I've already learned a lot just from that little bit. <clears throat> but what I want to work on today is not those stories. I would like you to tell, if you can, I want you to tell your stories. Because one thing that we, can, we have found at FAM is that one thing that really impacts lawmakers and people who, who can really move criminal justice reform is the collateral consequences of this kind of broken system. The impact on you guys. So that lawmaker I told you about 15 years ago who did a 180 on mandatory minimums, it's not because he heard about the person who was in prison. It's because he heard about those three kids that that woman left behind. So I would challenge you, remember I said at the beginning, I want you to be brave here. I would challenge you to tell me the stories of what you're going through, what your kids are going through, how it feels to be a mother. There seem to be a lot of mothers here. How it feels to be a mother, knowing that that child you had that special song with, you'll never be able to sing that song to. I would like you to get into that kind of thing. Um, because I, those stories that you just told me about your loved ones and their sentences, I'm not saying they're any less important. They're very important. They're very impactful. They're horrifying. They're horrifying. But today, I want to take the time for you. I want to take the time for you in terms of the story that I want you to produce, but also in terms of catharsis. I want, I, you can tell me about how you just cannot get up in the morning. How you just, you know, these things, the bills that aren't paid, the th you know, these are the things that, that do seem to have an impact. When, when, when people say they don't care about prisoners, that, you know, they deserve to be there, well, how can you say you don't care about the four-year-old left at home? 
how can you say you don't care about this woman losing her house? Like, did she do the crime? You know, no. Is she in prison? No, but it sure feels like she is. I would guarantee a lot of you feel like you're doing the same sen the sentence right along with your loved one. Look at how many nods I'm getting. Yes, yes. So I want to hear about that. They want to hear it. They don't necessarily want to hear about that, but they need to hear about that. They need to hear about that, okay? So, so their story, your loved one's story, versus your story. Their story is hugely important. I can help you tell that story, but today we're going to talk about your story, okay? Um, so, let's see. What time is it? How are we doing for time? It's 11 o'clock. It's 11. Okay, so we're pretty good. So, so I kind of wanted to do um, a little group storytelling exercise in the hopes of sort of you guys connecting with each other and also thinking about a different way to tell a story maybe. Um, so I want to set, we'll, we'll, we'll break into smaller groups to do this and we'll do that in a second. But um, first of all, I, I also noticed when you told your stories, there was a lot of emotion. People were crying, you got me to cry a little. There, there was a lot of emotion ev evoked. But when we talk about who you're telling your story to, the lawmakers, a lot of people you're trying to convince, um, they might have harder hearts. And so at FAM, we have found that the best kind of stories don't rely on facts and figures. Those are important stories. Journalists will tell those stories. The court documents tell those stories. The lawyers tell those stories. But the kind of stories we rely on are the stories that really make people feel. So that's a kind of a hard story to tell because it means you have to go there too. It's a, it's a painful place to go. But that's the kind of story that's going to change people. Which is kind of ironic because when I told you the story of Cindy and Michael and Dee Dee and, and, um, and, and Cynthia Powell, I did tell you about their sentences and they were horrifying. But I also tried to make you feel something about the kind of person they were. So, you know, um, there's an, an, an issue that has nothing to do with criminal justice reform or anything that you guys are going through, but I, I like to think of it. I think it works well for this point I'm trying to make. So there are a lot of people who don't vaccinate their kids, and it doesn't matter where you stand on that issue, but the, for the point of this story, people will say, um, you know, you need to vaccinate your kids. 92% of medical doctors say that it's, you know, they'll give a lot of statistics, like polio's eradicated, all the blah, 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 lots of facts and figures. The person who doesn't believe in vaccinations will come back and say, but you know what? My aunt got vaccinated, and um, when she got out of that vaccination, she went through a tunnel, and she came out of the tunnel, and her hair turned blue, and then her fingers fell off, and she was so upset. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe that 92% of doctors, and I don't know about polio being eradicated. So they are they are stuck in that story. That story is what has moved them. My aunt told me she got vaccinated, and her hair turned blue, and her fingers fell off. So I could tell that person till I'm blue in the fit. <laughs> sorry, blue in the hair. <laughs> till I'm <laughs> till I can't speak anymore. All the statistics about the importance of vaccinations. But all they're going to be stuck with is my aunt told me this happened. It's in our genetic material to hold stories, to not forget them. They, they're what stick with us, far beyond facts and figures, most of us, far beyond facts and figures. It's the stories. So we got to get you to tell the right kind of stories, and we got to get you to tell them in the right way. So the challenges, that we, we got a lot of challenges ahead of us because of the kind of cases we're talking about, the issue we're working about, vaccinations, put me on vaccinations, criminal justice reform, Ugh. It's a hard road. It's a really hard road to hoe. So we got some challenges. I see three challenges in the way you guys have to tell your stories and the way, you know, I'm going to stop talking about you versus fam because as of this moment, you are part of fam. And I'm going to talk more about that later, but this is ridiculous. I mean, you guys are exactly who we are. I think we're all, we're all talking about the same thing. So I'm going to talk about Bam, you're as part of FAM now. So the big challenges that we at FAM face are, first of all, what I said, people have already made up their minds about this issue. 
they've they've read all the scary headlines and they decided I'm sorry this is the so they're you know they're just stuck they're stuck they'll never be swayed and you can decide you need to decide yourself if you're going to try to sway that person or not it probably depends who that person is it might be your neighbor if your neighbor feels like sorry it's the way it is because they're your neighbor you might take the opportunity to tell them the story but in terms of a lawmaker that might be a harder harder hill to climb the other thing is fear people are afraid people are afraid of these issues i'm afraid of drug dealers i'm sorry they were an addict i'm afraid of whatever i'm afraid i'm afraid of prisoners sorry i don't want to talk about this issue so that's something we have we're up against how do we conquer the fear in the listener how do we break through that fear that fear that fear is real you know the world's a scary place and headlines are everywhere um, another huge challenge is our stories are hard our stories are really hard these are not well a lot of the stories that fam tells they're not innocent stories they're really hard stories to tell because people are fearful because they involve crime it's it's hard people these are just really hard stories to tell they're not sweet um, so your individual stories might be hard for different reasons but I think we can all agree here they're not easy stories to tell they might be hard because they bring up emotion in you but also because of whoever you're telling them to is afraid wants to dismiss you, doesn't want to hear it, has other ideas, there's lots of reasons, but we can all agree that these stories are really hard. So we've got those three challenges. So how do we meet those three challenges? How do we, should we just get in the closet? Should we just give up? Should we never tell our story? No. Okay, there are reasons we tell our story. First of all, I think this already happened here today, and the way Lena was describing the conferences before, it's very cathartic to tell your story. It creates community. It might feel really bad in the moment, but later you might feel like you got something off your chest. So sharing your story with people who are in the same boat is hugely important. At FAM, I'll talk about this more later, but at FAM we have this Facebook page called Families in Action. I want you all to go. If you have Facebook, I want you to go on it. Don't delay. It's a fantastic place to go. Questions, resources, people helping each other. We see posts all the time. I am so sad right at this minute. I don't know what to do. There's no more ice cream in the freezer. You know, and then somebody else will chime in. Just hang in there, sending you a big hug. Honestly, it's a, it's a fantastic place to be. So I want you all to promise me you'll join that Facebook page after we talk if you, if you have Facebook. Um, so that's a reason to tell the story. Um, okay, another, another way to meet these challenges I told you people are afraid of these stories. So let's find the part of the story that is the most sympathetic, that is the most sympathetic. It might be something about that person as a child, your loved one as a child. It might be something, of, as I was saying, about the impact on you and your own kids. It might be, um, it might be some piece of geography that you leave out of the story. It might be stuff you leave out of the story. But you got to shape your story, but go into it thinking what is the most sympathetic part of my story, okay? And I'm going to help you identify that. Um, oh, one part, I, I didn't talk about this yet, but financial impact. Impact on children, but also financial impact. That, that sways a lot of hearts and minds. Did you have a question? Just says families in action. Families, yes. And it's F like family, A like apple, M like mandatory, M like minimums, two M's, I L I E S in action. It's the it's it's in Facebook. Oh, the link. Um, no, but I can. I, 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 I'll, I'll send them an email. With the link. That's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll, I'll send everybody the email. Yeah. Um, it's really I I can't stress that enough. You should join. Um, Okay, so we already talked about your story versus your loved one's story. Okay, the last point I'll make is, and I, I talked a little bit about this before. At FAM, we tell stories over and over again to many different audiences and often. So that Cynthia Powell story I told you, I've told that hundreds of times. Everybody at FAM has. She has op-eds written about her. She Op-eds are... Um, pieces that we place in newspapers or magazines or websites. 
She has, she has, we've written letters to the editor for her that she has signed. She's not a writer herself, but she sure has a story to tell. And so we communicate with her. I'm very curious, are you guys in communication with your loved ones in prison? Some are, some aren't. Most are. Is it Core Links or JPay or something? Or? Core Links. Okay. So often we'll get stories through Core Links back and forth, and then we'll write it up and and we'll we'll place it in a newspaper or something like that. And I would like to offer that service to you. We'll talk more about that too. But anyhow, so these are ways we get their stories out, and we won't stop telling these stories until these people are household names. I want the entire state of Florida to know who Cynthia Powell is. You know, I really, I really feel strongly about this. So at FAM, we know Cynthia Powell's story, you know, like the back of our hand. And so sometimes we sort of forget that people don't know it. But we got to tell these stories over and over and over and over again. Vita, Vita thinks the whole world knows who Robert Ship is because she's told it so many times, but we don't. Robert Ship, that story is fantastic and very powerful. She's got to keep telling it, and she will, even after he gets out. So, so. So that's something I can help you with, FAM can help you with, but it's, it's really important. Get those stories out. Keep telling them, keep telling them, keep telling them over and over. And you'll find that the more you tell them, whether you're writing them, whether you're speaking them, however you're telling them, the story will get better and better and better and sharper and sharper and sharper. So the more you tell it, the better. Don't stop telling your story. So, um, but back to the point I was making about telling a story that's facts and figures, my son was 22, he got sentenced to life, this is the prison he's in, versus a story that's about feelings. My son's favorite game was backgammon, his little brother's name is John, um, these things, these things, that's where the story lies. That brings him to life. That makes him a real person that nobody's ever met before. The whole world has heard of a 22-year-old man who is serving a life sentence in XYZ prison. The whole world hasn't heard of this person. The whole world is going to feel sympathy for this person. So that's the kind of story I want you to tell. Um, before we start this, I want to just take a moment and ask if anybody has any questions or comments or anything about what I've said so far. Okay. So, so look at the thing that says storytelling group exercise. Um, does everybody have that? Anybody need one? Okay. So. At the top, just what I was saying, stories that make the listener feel are much stronger for advocacy than stories that rely on facts and figures. Okay, so here's an example, and it's just five simple, I mean four facts. George Nelson was seen by a neighbor, Ron Miller, flying an orange kite in the park early one Sunday morning. Ron later found out that his son's orange kite was missing. Ron accused George of stealing the kite. George didn't deny it, but he apologized. And then this other fact, 87% of marriages end in divorce when a child dies. So, so those, those are some facts just thrown out there for you. Now, this story is a written story. But when you do the exercise, it doesn't have to be written. We, you can also just talk about a story you would tell. So the story that came out of those facts is this. George Nelson had a happy family. He and his wife, Louise, had one daughter, Emily. Emily had a beautiful dress that she got on her eighth birthday. It was bright orange with pink sparkles all over it. When she twirled, it looked like the sun. Sadly, Emily got very sick that year and died of cancer. Louise was inconsolable. She left George and went to live by herself in mountains far, far away. George stayed in the apartment and did little but sleep in the bed that was now too big for him. Sometimes he would stare out the window at the neighborhood families. One day he saw the Miller boy who lived down the hall come through the front gate. George saw a flash of orange as the boy stuffed something in, his gar in the garbage bin. That night, when it was dark, George crept down to the trash. Buried in there was a kite, bright orange. It was torn in a few places. George pulled it out and fixed it up as best he could, and then he walked to the neighborhood park. Just as he arrived, a nice breeze picked up, and George found that the kite seemed to jump right out of his hands, tugging at the, at the string that he had to grip tightly to keep from losing hold. 
He felt an unfamiliar grin return to his lips as the kite danced in the wind. It was Emily, he knew in his heart, and as he flew that kite for hours, George knew that he would be okay. He would never be the same, but he would be okay. Okay, so, so, it's kind of a sad story. It's kind of a sweet little story. And the point is, you know a lot more from that story, and you feel a lot more from that story than just the facts and figures above. So, so here's how we did it. We were given these facts, and you guys have your own facts. You pretty much gave me the facts when we went around the room before. And I said, okay, what, how can I make these facts, what can I add to these facts to make people feel? Everybody has color in their life. Everybody has that kite, those colors, bright orange, those, those details. Everybody has those. I challenge you to find them. Um, okay, how, how can we humanize? So again, when we went around in the first, so lots of names, lots of sentence lengths, some ages, but not a lot of humanity. I, want, I challenge you to find and show the humanity in your story. Show me the individual person you're talking about, whether it's your own story or your loved one's story. I need some humanity. Um, and then think about the circumstance, sort of the bigger picture. So I actually thought, I don't think we have enough time to split into the smaller groups, but I, I, wanted, I wanted to challenge some of you to just, t if you can, tell it, make a story out of these next facts. Just tell us. You don't have to write it down if you want. But um, the, the challenge here is I want you to try to make us laugh or feel really sad or get really angry, okay? Um, so using the facts and figures below, make a story that will move us, maybe even make us cry, laugh, or get angry. Feel free to invent and add anything you want to make these facts and figures come to emotional life. We're not going to do this next part because we're not splitting into groups. But your story does not need to be long or complicated. The goal is to make us feel. Okay? So here are your facts and figures. These are all made up. Mary Jones is 35. She works as a waitress at a restaurant called Ice Cream for Everyone. Her co-worker told their boss that Mary stole chocolate chip ice cream and was selling it for a really high price in the neighborhood. The boss fired Mary without anyone asking anyone else if the accusation was true. 78% of waitresses in the United States are falsely accused of stealing food. Mary and her co-worker hate each other. Okay, so I want you to just spend a few minutes now thinking about these and you could jot something down and if anybody would accept my challenge, and raise their hand after a few minutes here and try to tell me, a, tell me a moving story about those facts. That would be great. And you can talk to each other about it too. Um, so, go. Try to write that story. Yeah, exactly. So that's a good question. Lena was just asking about context. Add any context you want. I'm giving away one of the things sure, she yeah. thought of. But Mary's daughter was very sick. Add anything you want. Have a story to tell? Don't be shy. Thank you. What's your name again? Linda. Linda. Thank you. Mary works as in, uh, at a restaurant, which is our second job. She has a sick daughter that she takes care of by herself. She also has a co-worker at that job. They used to go with her husband. 
and she was the cause of their breakup. <laughs> yes. The co-worker was very jealous and still, still thought of Mary as a threat since she still was uh, her husband. And so she decided that she would go and she would uh, tell the, uh, she, knowing that uh, Wafers uh, uh, accused of her, she decided she would go to the, uh, her boss and tell her that Mary was still free. So uh, in the end, she got rid of Mary and, uh, <laughs> and uh, but she's still miserable with that cheating. <laughs> Hell hath no fury like a woman's sword. <laughs> That's good. That's really good. Thank you, Linda. Okay, who else? I didn't finish the story, but just the plot was she was going to become the head of the uh, ice cream cartel. <laughs> <laughs> Take revenge. <laughs> That's an excellent point. I like the way that story is going. Mm -hmm. What's your name? My name is Jamsa. Okay. Maybe you want to use people on his yeah. It's not a lot. 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 And she didn't want anybody else to know, so she hired a lawyer uh, to take her son aside. So she needed extra money because that's so she was selling this uh, ice cream outside. Thank you, Shamsa. And that that brings up I said your story versus your loved one's story. So that you know, like yeah. Mary needed extra money. Her son yeah, was in prison. Yeah. 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 That's true. They didn't have It's very, very, very familiar, sad story. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? I kind of finished that. Okay, so I said Mary now is homeless. She's panhandling on the side of an intersection. People who, who pass by in their car judge her. Hey, she is young, get a job. What people don't know is that Mary's uneducated and waitressing was the only job she knew. Yeah. <laughs> that was really good. See that, that, that's very sad. I really appreciate that one, good job. Okay, anybody else? I saw so many more pens moving, people. Okay, I think you have one. <laughs> this place is called ice cream for everyone, isn't it? That's what two waitresses who worked in the restaurant thought as they both raced towards the last chocolate chip ice cream bucket there. Since Mary got there first, she grabbed it and ran out the door with it before the other waitress should, could. She just lost her puppy after it got run over and needed the ice cream to grieve. She, of course, would pay for it later. But the other waitress broke up with a guy and needed it too. So she told on Mary, getting her fired. But Mary didn't care. She was at home with a mouthful of chocolate chip ice cream. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Oh, gosh. That's really good one. Lots of color. Anybody else? I feel like I saw so many pens moving over there. Thank you. <laughs> so I just followed the example from one of the other stories. Um, Mary is a single mom. She's poor. She's in debt, and she needed to pay a lot of medical bills. And in order to keep her son off the streets and out of gangs and uh, away from drugs, she wanted to pay for his football camp, which he was dying to go to. So she stole the ice cream and she sold it only for a dollar more um, than what still, uh, was sold at the ice cream shop. And um, her co-worker, Bitter Betty, was, <laughs> you know, um, she was just, she was just angry that, that Mary had 
the means, or I guess you could say the sense of mind, to do what she had to do to support her son and ratted her out. Um, but, you know, her, her motive was sincere and was honest to, to keep her son off the streets. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, motive, sincere and honest, I like that. Okay, anybody else? Okay, so Lena, I think we should probably do the telling, everybody tell their own story now time-wise, right? Sure, okay. yeah. Did you want to do the zoom in, zoom out, or is there no time for that? So, okay, there, well, we could, we could start with, what I think we'll do next is um, you guys can go around and tell your own stories again, like I know you did in past conferences that was so effective. Um, and I just want you to really keep in mind some of the things we've talked about in terms of color and evoking emotion, and whether you're telling your story or your loved one's story, or maybe some combination, but I would really like you to take this opportunity to try to tell your story. I, I'm very interested in your story. You're sitting in front of me. I'm very interested in your loved one's story too, but I wanna know, how did you get here today? Is your car breaking down? All these things, you know. I wanna know how this affects you. Did you have a question? Oh, I thought you were raising your hand. Um, I, just, I just wanna give an example yeah. if it's possible. Yes. Um, so just through, personal conversations um, with uh, Hedaya's older daughter, Vim, who was very much involved with the conference. They would always talk about the plight of their father and what happened to them, but it was only when Reem and I shared a room together at a conference that I learned the amazing struggle of her mother, how they basically had to squat in a house. They had nothing because they were very crudely stripped from their own home. Their father was prosecuted in another state. They had no contacts there, no house, no money. And, you know, they had to clean houses. They had to scrape and do whatever they could to get by and survive. And the amazing struggle and determination and fight of Hedaya, who's sitting right here, I mean, just to, to raise all her kids by herself for so many years, and they were just babies. Um, and that didn't come out in our storytelling exercise. Yeah. That came yeah. out just through speaking one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. So it's these types of stories I hope we can get out also yeah. today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. That is a perfect example. And thank you so much for sharing that story. I, I wrote a small story about me. So when I get to okay. Say, wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. So, so the re I'll say it again because it, it's it's worth telling saying again the reason we tell your stories versus their stories is there are a lot of people out there who don't care about them but they will care about you that sounds really harsh but it's true it's really true and then the other reason to tell your stories is it's gonna help you it's gonna help you it helped Vita I mean it I, I think you would probably agree Hedai it telling your story it's a catharsis, but it also is empowering. It, you tell your story, what's happening to you, you share your truth, and, and she's inspired, you know. So she hasn't forgotten that story. I don't know how long ago that was, but anyhow, so there's a lot. Please don't think your stories are not worthy, your own stories. They are just as worthy. We care about you. We are families against mandatory minimums. We really care about you. So, so with all that in mind, let's start telling your story. One, the thing that Lena was mentioning is there's another storytelling exercise that sometimes people do called zoom in and zoom out. It can get very easy to get bogged down in the details or not tell enough details. So if anybody's interested, if you want us to, do, maybe Lena and I can practice doing this together. What happens is somebody tells a story and they start talking and if, they're, if the listener thinks they're telling too many details, they say, zoom out, stop, zoom out, and they start telling a less detailed story. If the opposite happens and there's not enough detail and you say, wait, wait, how fast was the car going? Then you say, stop, zoom in, and we zoom in. So if anybody wants us to do that as they tell their story, um, we can we can try that too. It might be helpful to you if, if that makes any sense. Do you have any questions about that particular part of things? No, but uh, something I um, I just want to add to what you said. When you tell a story, this 15 years from my husband in jail, I've been talking to like a lot of people from the high level to the regular people. Yeah. I learned 
make it very quick. Like I can tell the story in like less than three minutes. Right. Right. This is very important. Both right. of it, then they ask the meter. But if you talk too much, they're gonna lose interest. Right. Or like me, I can't just focus. I like I have, I have kind of ADD. I can't I can't focus. Right. So I learn to just make it very quick. Yes. I this think that's great quick. advice. Great advice. But as I said, there are many kinds of, there are many ways to tell your story. The elevator pitch, you've heard about the elevator pitch, the time it takes to get from the ground floor to the 10th floor, which is the, uh, the floor that fam is on, that's, that's not very long. And so you could have a version of your story that's super short, a version that's maybe a little bit longer, and then quite a long version that maybe you want to write out, or you want to write a letter to the editor, or you want to write an op-ed, or you just want to write it and put it on the FAM website. That could be a longer version. So that's great advice, though. In terms of speaking your story, it's better to make it brief. Do you want to get, maybe narrow it down, you know, know your audience? So yeah. How can they know which version of the story to tell based on the audience? Uh-huh. Well, well, I think that's really important because I don't know who you guys are visiting on Monday, but Monday will be lawmakers. So lawmakers, as I was saying, they're probably going to be more interested in the impact of your loved one's incarceration on you. That, that's probably the way to go. But in terms of for today's purposes and catharsis and us all getting to know each other, some combo platter is probably a good idea. I feel I think I kind of think I'd rather have this be a little loosey goosey and whatever you feel compelled to, to tell today after having heard me talk about adding detail and color into the point of your story is to try to get us to feel and to get away from just facts and figures. So that's the audience today. So I guess we can give you an option if you want feedback to do the zoom in, zoom out exercise. Yeah. And if you don't we can just tell your story. So yeah. we can Go one by one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, where should we start? Um, Do you want to go the side of the? That's a good idea. Or? That's a good idea. Okay. Are you sure? Do it. Okay. No, Steve, I'll go through the road. Talk about how we feel. Yeah, I want. I want. Steve is one of our major lobbyists. <laughs> okay. You should. I think Steve starts. So, um, when this first happened, the thing that happened to me. Wait, I'm sorry, Dana. Do you want feedback? Do you want to be a part yeah. of the exercise? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So um, I got a call from an older lady saying that, did you hear the news? And I said, no, what's going on? She said that my son uh, got picked up by the FBI. And um, so my first thing was to drop the phone and start crying. And then I just kept on crying and crying and crying. And I was waiting by the phone for, for a call from my son. And later on, um, it just had a big impact on me where, you know, I couldn't sleep at night and I, I had many, many sleepless nights and I cried all the time, which wasn't good because I had to cut down on the, the hours of my job, which almost I became homeless because of that. And my whole community basically also, you know, didn't help out and that was the effect on me that I could understand the story of Mary and other people as well and Hidaya, where I had, you know, an eviction notice on my door and many times I couldn't sleep and I was almost starving and you know, I would not all day. And a lot of people didn't even know that I was going through that because I just kept it to myself. So, yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me your name again? Layla. Layla, okay. Um, I thought that was a beautiful story and you focused so much on the impact on you and I also like the level of detail you, d you said. I got a phone call. We could immediate, couldn't you picture her on the phone? I could see you talking on the phone. I could see you crying. I would kind of like to know a little more specific detail, actually factual details, like where you worked, where did, where did you almost lose your job, what kind of job was that? That's interesting to people. It makes you a real person. Um, it's interesting to me that you didn't mention much about your son at all, but I got it. I got it right away. I know, I know what you're talking about. Um, and you did a wonderful job of showing us how it made you feel. I think you did a, a great job. I think you did a great job. Um, Steve, do you want to tell your story and then? Um, 
I read in the paper that a imam had been arrested for terrorism, and I, on reading this story, it didn't make sense to me. And I eventually became uh, contacted the law firm. I got in touch with Kathy, whose law firm was representing him. And they decided to hire me, basically, to spend time with him in jail because he was, uh, while awaiting trial, he was in um, solitary confinement. And so my job was to get down there two, three days a week and sit there and talk to Yassine uh, Araf, the imam, and uh, just trying to keep him happy because he just needed to tell his story. Um, and as I sat there and talked to him, he began to tell me about his life in Kurdistan and about the case against him and how it was completely built on lies. And at the time I was like, really, the government's just one lie after another? And he said, no, I can prove it. And he began to slowly prove it. And eventually we began to work on a motion uh, for bail. And this thing got longer and longer and longer. And finally I joked with him. I said, uh, once you're out of jail, we're going to publish this thing as a novel, uh, showing all the lies that the government had told about you. And then we went to trial and he was convicted. And the day after he was convicted, I went in to the jail and I felt horrible. I, I felt... I still feel horrible. Um, and I brought with me a stack of yellow sheets and I pushed them across to him and I said, you see, maybe it's time we started to write your book. And he said, oh, that's ridiculous, I don't want to do that. And I said, no, I think people want to hear your story. And the next time I came back, he had filled them all with his handwriting about his story. And eventually we published a book and that was sort of how it all began. It just got released. Thank you so much, Steve. That was a fantastic story. Um, so I could see all of the, it's important, like what you see in your mind's eye. A story should make you see something in your mind's eye and I could see you in that jail cell. I could see you reading that newspaper. I imagined you for some reason at your breakfast table, but I don't know where you were. Um, <laughs> you know, I could see all those details. The, the, the one thing missing for me was the time frame. How long ago was that? I, that's important, particularly since we're talking about long sentences. Like, yeah, that's a great, so more than 10 years. So that's important. T time is really important, especially for our issue. Um, I also felt, uh, you bring it, you know, you started getting emotional yourself while you're telling a story, which is fantastic. Don't ever stop feeling or showing that emotion because particularly lawmakers, they, they need to know you're real people and that will make such an impact. Um, so I, th I thought that was a great story. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to just back up one second. I said I wanted to hear stories about impact on you, but if you feel like you want to tell me, this, us, the stories of your loved ones, please go ahead. Please, please share your stories, whatever stories, stories you need to tell today, and and you know get feedback on how you're telling them. And you, but if you if you are going to talk about your loved one, I would urge you again to go beyond just the facts and figures and maybe talk about something they're doing in prison now that you know about that's really horrifying to you or really beautiful to you, or maybe talk about something the way they were as a child or a teenager or in their adult life, you, something that you might not normally talk about. So, so I want to open the parameters to that too.